I'm going to go through the um, allegory of the cave from Plato right now. Um, and you should have your text with you to kind of follow along. And I, I did mention that um, it is a little bit troubling at first for many students because you have Socrates talking to somebody else who is Glaucon. And it can be a little bit disheartening or disconcerting trying to figure out what are exactly, what really are Plato's views in this. So that is a bit of a problem. And I'll tell you right now, the problem has never gone away um, in spite of people trying to interpret it for many centuries now. And now Plato is writing around, you know, we can estimate just after Lount C, around 400 um, BCE or so. And he's coming in a time in ancient Greece, in Athens, um, just after Socrates, just after Socrates. So that's when he's writing, and there was a time period of what they called tyrants. And Plato had gone around throughout Greece trying to work with the various tyrants, trying to get them to, you know, somewhat uh, bring down their, the nature of their rule and be a little more understanding um, and a little more um, cooperative. And Socrates was actually put to death in Athens um, while Plato was doing this and while Plato was working through it. Um, <clears throat> I've always seen Plato as being more politically acute than Socrates. Now we do know both of these figures did exist. Socrates did teach Plato a great deal about philosophy. And Plato did teach Aristotle a great deal about philosophy. They didn't know each other. Aristotle, if you don't know, did actually tutor Alexander the Great later on. So there is something in line going on, but it doesn't really work to say Socrates is the same as Plato and Plato is the same as Aristotle. It doesn't work that well. It doesn't work that easily. Um, many people do, when they approach this reading, take Socrates as speaking for Plato. Many people do take that. In fact, I would say the majority of scholars do that. That's the way I'm going to present it at first, and then towards the end of the video I'm going to show you some of the issues with it and some of the problems with it. You are able to take it any which way you want, but do understand most people do interpret this as Socrates speaking for Plato. Okay? Um, <clears throat> having read his other um, dialogues, I, I guess I'm a little more aware that there's um, problems with that. You're always going to run into issues with it, but that's the way I'm going to present it at first. Okay? So if you go to page 23, I, don't, I won't give you an exact quotation um, from most of the page, but understand what he's setting up is you know, the allegory of human understanding. This is known as the allegory of the cave, and I don't think this will probably come through too well in the video, but really what you get with the allegory, what he sets up there, is really a wall at one end, and then you have some kind of human beings down here chained in place. It's kind of an odd allegory, but um, we'll work with play our Socrates on this. Then what you have are people right here in the middle holding up puppets or other things or items and a fire there. All these people can see are the shadows cast upon the wall. All they can see are shadows cast upon the wall. That's it. They don't know what's going on behind them. They have no idea. They're chained into place. That's what the whole page of 23 sets up. That's all it is. So if you want to and you need help imagine, or um, figuring it, putting it into an image, you can just hit Google, go to images, and type in Allegory of the Cave, and you're going to see drawings much like this, probably a little bit larger. The end goal of this whole allegory is to explain how Socrates sees how the mind works, how the human understanding actually functions. And he sees it as being much like the person right here that we understand our world in this way. We don't see what's behind it. There's always something going on behind it. That's the nature of the allegory. Okay? Let me walk through it for a bit. And going down to the bottom on page 23, you have paragraph 13. And Socrates says, and he's responding to Glaucon, if you don't, um, many people get annoyed with Glaucon because he seems to just say yes, yes, yes. At this point he does, at other points he actually debates Socrates. But at this point, um, Socrates says to Glaucon, To them I said the truth would be literally nothing but the shadows of the images. So for these people right here, their truth is what's on the wall. It's merely a shadow. 
They understand nothing that's going on behind here. They have no idea what's going on. If you go over to page 24, I'll go into a little more detail. <clears throat> this is paragraph 15. I'm going to break it into two parts. At the top of 24, paragraph 15. Um, and now look again and see what will naturally follow if the prisoners are released and disabused of the error. At first, when any of them is liberated and compelled suddenly to stand up and turn his neck around and walk and look towards the light, he will suffer sharp pains. The glare will distress him and he will be unable to see the realities of which his former state, um, of which in his former state had been the shadows. So in other words, if he's taken out of this and he gets to see the real world, it's going to be incredibly stressful. It's not a stress that's so much physical, but it's a mental stress because we're talking about the nature of the mind, but it's a mental stress that becomes physical. In other words, the mind is coordinating everything with how this person interacts with the world. It has a very real um, embodiment in the thinking, but it also gets expressed in the pain and suffering with understanding how the world is entirely different than you were led to believe by all of your experiences in this shadow world, okay? Where everything was just an image. So now when you're disabused of that, you're going to actually go through physical suffering, but really, it's a mental suffering that's getting embodied, being made part of your person. Watch what he does with this as he continues. And then conceive someone saying to him that what he saw before was an illusion, but that now when he is approaching nearer to being, and his eye is turned towards more real existence, he has a clearer vision. What will be his reply? And you may further imagine that his instructor is pointing to the objects as they pass and requiring him to name them. Will he not be perplexed? Will he, um, he not fancy that the shadows which he formerly saw are truer than the objects which are now shown to him? So in other words, if you take him out of the situation and then point to the actual objects, it will be confusing for him. He will be taken totally off guard. The object is here, the shadow is there, he might be attracted to the shadow as the real item. That was his reality before, and he's going to be drawn to it. So it's going to be very difficult to understand the real world as being somehow more important than the shadow world or the image world. It's going to be difficult to do that. And so this is what Socrates is walking Glaucon through with the allegory. Going from one level of knowledge to the other is going to be difficult these mental challenges are actually going to be embodied, are going to become part of the person, him or herself. Okay? Jumping down to paragraph um, 17. And if he is compelled to look straight at the light, will he not have a pain in his eyes which will make him turn away and, t and to take, and take in the objects of vision which he can see, and which he can conceive in reality clearer than the image which are now being shown to him? So now he's being taken out to the real world and being caused to look at the light directly, in other words, the sun. This would be entirely overwhelming. And so then he would be guided back down to the real images. Then he would see that there are, in fact, three different levels of understanding. What he's starting to set up here, and when we're coming out of the allegory, and what he's going to go through are these three different levels. These are absolutely essential understanding Plato and Socrates, these three different levels. This first level is this imaginary world. That's the world of the shadows. And in other points in the Republic, Socrates develops this as painting, literature, and other things, where you get some kind of image of the real world. Shadows are essentially the same thing. Okay? We're not going to read the whole Republic, but if you ever do, you're going to see what I'm talking about, literature, um, in paintings and sculpture are very much in this imaginary world along with the shadows. The next level of the mind is the real world. This is the world most of us interact with on a day-to-day -day basis with we see real you know, boards, real chairs, real tables, and all this other stuff. That's the real world we encounter. Okay? So that's what the person was taken out of, the shadow world, and moved into the real world. The third level that he just introduced here with the sunlight is the ideal world. This is the um, light itself. The light itself, which for most people, at first, is blinding. And you want to turn away from it 
the exact same way that people coming out of the shadow world want to turn away from the real world and want to go back down into the shadow world. The same way he's pushing away from the light is the same way that people of the real world will push away from the ideal back to the real world. Okay? So that's what he's doing with it. Jump up if you could. Um, if you can go over to page 25, and I'm going to go a little bit further with this. Um, if you go to paragraph 29, this is a fairly famous paragraph. And if they were in the habit of conferring honors among themselves on those who were quickest to observe the passing shadows, and to remark which of them went before, and which followed after, and which were there um, together, and who were um, therefore best able to draw conclusions as to the future. Do you think that he would care for such honors and glories, or envy the possessors of them? Would he not say with Homer, better to be the poor servant of a poor master, and to endure anything rather than think, as they do and live after their manner? So what he's done here, what Socrates has done, he said, if you take this person out, put him or her in the real world, and then he looks back on people still within this reality or this world of looking at shadows and thinking that they're real, he would look upon this world with contempt. In other words, with pity upon the people still living at that level. Okay? That quotation from Homer is actually quite interesting. This is Achilles talking um, to Odysseus, telling him, that in, um, when Achilles, excuse me, when um, Odysseus goes down into Hades um, within the Odyssey, and he talks to Achilles, and Achilles said, instead of being a great hero living in Hades, and this is not, the, again, keep in mind this is not the Christian hell, it's not like that. It's instead where all shades, all people who have lived go. Achilles has said, instead of being a, a hero in Hades, he would rather be the poor servant um, of a poor master. In other words, it would be far better to be in the real world than to be in Hades under any circumstances. In other words, it's far better to be in the real world up here than to be living in the shadow world under any circumstances at all. Okay? Because again, there's so much contempt for living in this imaginary world, for not dealing with things that are real the way they actually are. You would have a contempt for people no matter how great they would be considered in the previous world, on the lower level world. Okay? So the real world has an actual contempt for the imaginary world and upon the honors that they would have. Um, again, very famous paragraph and very important to how I'm going to show you this works. Okay? Um, and again, Homer was a poet. If you don't know, he was a poet coming about three to four hundred years before Socrates and Plato, but he was already extremely well known to the Greek world and was um, probably the leading writer um, for, you know, ever since. Jump down if you could to the bottom of 25, and I'm going to go on to 26. This is paragraph 35, and where Socrates starts actually dismantling the allegory. And he says, this entire allegory I said, you may now apprehend, dear Glaucon, to the previous argument. The prison house is the world of sight. The light of the fire is the sun, and you will not misapprehend me if you interpret the journey upward to be the ascent of the soul to the intellectual world according to my poor belief, which at your desire I have expressed, whether rightly or wrongly, God knows. Now, one thing I do want to mention, please keep in mind we're dealing with around, you know, estimating around 400 to 500 BCE. Um, we're not dealing with a Christian or a Jewish conception of God. Um, the Greeks had not interacted enough with, um, with Jewish culture, and Christianity would be um, about half a millennia off. So when he said God's, God knows, he's dealing with Zeus, or some um, variation on him. So what he's done is said that really what he's explaining is that the, the allegory of the real world to the imaginary world works the same way as people who understand the ideal world how they relate to people of the real world. So what he introduced with the light is this idea of ideals, of wisdom, truth, and beauty at an absolute level. Um, and it's um, correlated with light. People of the real world turn away from it and find it troubling and painful. But people who work with it, and that's going to be the philosophers in Socrates' mind, 
these are the ones who really understand at a far deeper level how the real world is working. These are the ones here in relation to the people if they were part of the real world here. So what Socrates has done is set out a relationship between the real world to the imaginary world, but he wants, wants Glaucon to understand that the allegory introduces the idea of how ideal people who understand the ideal relate to people of the real world. In other words, the knowledge of the ideal is going to be painful, and it's going to push you away at first if you're coming from the real world. But once you have it, you're going to have a far, far better understanding of what's really going on in the real world. That's what the allegory really does. That's what it does for Socrates in relating to Glaucon and how he's trying to set up human understanding, but also how he's trying to set up politics within his ideal republic. And again, this is a selection from the longer work um, from the republic. Jump up, if you will, up to page 27 um, and paragraph 45. And I'm going to get to a little bit of his assumption about human nature. And it's a little bit complicated. This is in 45 and then in paragraph 48. Um, in 45, he says, whereas our argument shows that the power and capacity of learning exists in the soul already, and that just as the eye was unable to turn from darkness to light without the whole body, so too the instrument of knowledge can only by the movement of the whole soul be turned from the world of becoming into that of being, and learn by degrees to endure the sight of being, and of the brightest and the best of being, or in other words, the good. That's a very confusing paragraph. What he's talking about is that the human soul, or the hu or humanity is at the real world, has the capacity to learn. Innately has the capacity to learn, but does not have the understanding of the ideal. It can become the ideal, but it doesn't yet achieve it. It doesn't have it innately. So it has the capacity to become but it doesn't already have it. That's that nuance of being and becoming. It has the capacity to become something, but it isn't there yet. Remember when I talked about ideologies, um, and a liberal ideology will assume that humankind is innately good and rational. What Plato does here is not assume that humankind is innately good and rational, but innately able to learn what's good and become rational. So it doesn't start off that way, but it can become that way. It can become that way, but you've got to be careful because it can become something very different too. That's his assumption about human nature. It doesn't fit squarely within the conservative or the liberal camp because the conservative is going to assume that human nature is by and large corrupted and is actually prone to irrational and destructive behaviors. What Socrates is going to do is say it could go in either way. Okay? And jump down to 48, if you would. And whereas the other so-called virtues of the soul seem to be akin to bodily qualities, for even when they are not originally innate, and that's a very important phrase, not originally innate, they can be implanted later by habit and exercise. The wisdom, um, the, the wisdom more than anything else contains a divine element which always remains, and by this conversion is rendered useful and profitable, or on the other hand, hurtful and useless. That's a very important point with Socrates. It can become useful and profitable, or hurtful and useless. It can go, human nature can go in either way. You can start off from the real world and go into the ideal, or you can become very damaging and very destructive. Okay? It's going to be a very important point once we get to Machiavelli. I'm actually going to come back to that. Did you ever observe the narrow intelligence flashing from the keen eye of a clever rogue? How eager he is, how cleverly he pul his paltry soul sees the way to his end. He is the reverse of blind, but his keen eyesight is forced into the service of evil, and he is mischievous in proportion to his cleverness. So people coming from the real world can become quite destructive and evil. They are not, by, uh, not innately good in understanding what is virtuous and wise. Okay? Um, jump up, if you will, to 
to page, um, excuse me, page 28, um, paragraph 57, okay? You have again forgotten, my friend, I said, the intention of the legislator who did not aim at making any one class of state happy above the rest. The happiness was to be the whole state, and he held the citizens together by persuasion and necessity, making them benefactors of the state and therefore benefactors of one another. To this end he created them, not to please themselves, but to be instruments in binding up the state. This is a very important step of what he does. Um, what he first starts off with is this allegory to explain how the mind works and how humanity is basically constructed. And then what he constructs is a model for politics out of it. What he just did is to place philosophers, people such as himself, Socrates, above the leaders of the state who would have been trained in what is good, been trained in what is wisdom, what is beauty, what is truth. They would have been trained in the ideal. They would have been brought up to the ideal world, brought into a fuller understanding of what is um, right, and they will be the leaders of the people, the people living in the real world. So what he's done is to really create a political state on three levels. The philosophers are the ones who live in the ideal world and understand it far better than anybody else. Socrates places himself above, um, among them. The leaders of the ideal state will be brought up into the ideal, educated in it, they will understand it, but then they are forced back down into the real world where the rest of the people live. And they will instruct the state and lead the state. This is built on hierarchies, and this is what makes Socrates and by many people's estimate, is Plato a conservative. Because throughout his understanding of the human mind, and his understanding of how politics should work in the ideal state, there are hierarchies. Without the hierarchies, the state cannot function at its best. And its end goal is always the happiness of the people. To attain that happiness, you must have wisdom in your leaders, and you must have an, a, an understanding of the ideal. You must have that. That comes from the philosophers who are at the highest point. They train the leaders who are then forced back down amongst the people who do not have an understanding of the ideal. It would be too much for them. Instead, the philosophers hold on to it, the leaders are trained in it, and they run the people. So there is built within Socrates always these hierarchies of knowledge and of levels and of status. His end goal is not the most productive state or a powerful state, but really a happy state built on wisdom, built on ideals of understanding the truth. That's what Socrates' end game is. I'm going to stop there in it, and as you go through the rest of Plato, you're going to see these three levels play out. But always keep in mind that there are some problems with this. Most people who read this or a little bit troubled by Socrates and his state. When he goes on in other parts of the Republic, um, there are real problems. He starts banning people from the ideal state, such as poets. Poets will be banned from the state, so will painters. And it gets troubling. Um, and many of us who have looked at it um, really say, hey, there's problems with this. There's problems with this allegory. There's problems throughout the entire Republic. Um, you can see and I hope you um, probably picked up on some of these issues, Socrates is really an image for Plato. So Plato is using an image of somebody else to demonstrate his philosophy. And really, Socrates is using an allegory to teach about these three levels. An allegory is really an image of an idea. It's not the ideal itself, it's an image of it. And then even within those allegory, he's quoting Homer. I hope you can see that there are really problems with taking this in an absolute straightforward manner, that Socrates speaks for Plato, and that it's really a straightforward one, two, three, because in fact, you see this throughout Socrates, he's using images to explain ideals. That's a little troubling. And Plato must have been aware that he's using Socrates to explain his ideas. 
At which point does Socrates equate with Plato, and do images equate with the ideal? It's a very challenging issue, and it's an issue I'll be very clear about. Um, scholars haven't decided on it. Most scholars that I've read do think it is a straightforward correlation of Plato to Socrates. Many do not. Um, Gadamer and a few other scholars do see the problems with it, and they actually go through and work with these contradictions to come up and derive what they think is Plato's view, which is a little more nuanced and a little more um, uh, sophisticated. So you can take this any which way you want to. You can take this as a straightforward view. Um, Socrates stands for Plato, or you can get into the troubles um, that come up with it. Um, it's up to you. Okay. I hope this clarifies it a little bit and that you actually see the complexity as something that's good and challenging because these readings all along are probably quite challenging for most folks. This is just another challenge built within another reading. and It's part of why I think Plato is seen to be such a great writer because he challenges people. He challenges people through the figure of Socrates. Okay, take care.